Hi, my friends. Welcome to Inside the Minds of Authors. I'm DC Gomez, your host and also an indie author. I'm thrilled you're joining me today for another fun interview with a passionate author. We're going to kick off this show with an exciting reading, so let's get started. Good morning. My name is Marie Watts. I'm so thrilled to be here with DC today. I'm going to talk to you a little bit about my trilogy. I've got two of the three volumes out right now, and the trilogy is Warriors for Equal Rights. And I'm going to do a reading from the first book is called The Cause List. So let me kind of set the stage for you here. The trilogy is about federal investigators that work for the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission. And their job is to go out into the public sector and find and root out employment discrimination. And that's everything from sex harassment to age discrimination. In the first book, we start off with the head character, Alice Arden, being called to Washington, D.C., and she is put in charge of a special task force that Obama administration has been pushing because Obama wants his civil rights legacy to be good. So they're having a special unit that's going to root out lots of discrimination. Alice is put in charge of it, and the office is in Austin, Texas. So I'm going to pick up in chapter three, and Alice has been assigned a special case by the head of the agency. And so she is going to go investigate it. So here we go. Chapter three. Alice wearily pushed open the door of Caulfield's office. Sleep had eluded her as she grappled with nightmares about being sexually harassed as a teen. She'd worked at a fast food restaurant while in high school and had been sexually assaulted by her manager. She understood the humiliation of being treated like a sex object. Alice had never forgotten the smell of stale tobacco as the man grabbed her, forcing his tongue into her mouth. She had complained to the owner, but he didn't believe her. Desperate, Alice had walked off the job. Too embarrassed to tell her mother, she'd had to endure being called a quitter. Alice still regretted that she hadn't fought for vindication. The receptionist escorted her to a conference room. One look at the antique mahogany inlaid table with its oversized black leather chairs emblazoned with a C for Caulfield told Alice that Jack Caulfield had made millions representing plaintiffs. He knew his business and he would know if Alice made any wrong moves in the investigation. An older man dressed in a brown suit stood and shook hands with Alice. Miss Arden, I'm Jack Caulfield. This is my client, Janine Lipscomb. Miss Lipscomb offered her hand. Alice responded while eyeing her critically. The CP, an attractive brunette, let me backtrack, CP stands for charging party. That's the one who files the charge, was wearing an impeccably tailored blue suit and an expensive looking watch. She was extremely slim. A whiff of perfume lingered in the air. Could I get you some coffee, Caulfield asked? That would be wonderful. Just some sweetener. Caulfield picked up the telephone and asked his receptionist to bring in three coffees. Alice opened her briefcase and extracted the case file in her computer. Thank you for speaking with me today, Alice said. Miss Lipscomb, I'm going to ask questions and type your answers on an affidavit. After I've finished, I'll give you a chance to read over it and make any additions or corrections. This is your statement, and I don't want to put words in your mouth. And then I'll ask you to sign it. You're free to keep a copy. Do you have any questions? I've explained everything to Miss Lipscomb, so I think we're fine, Caulfield said. Wonderful. Now, Miss Lipscomb, tell me a little about yourself. What is your background, and how did you get the job with Bighorn Outfitters? I've worked in retail for about 10 years. My job before Bighorn was managing the women's department in Macy's in New York. I met Davis, Mr. Cummings, at a fundraising party for state Republicans last fall. When he found out what I did, he asked me to make an application to be the manager of the new Houston store. He called me several times, encouraging me to apply. Did you go through an interview process? I did. I went to the New York store and interviewed with Rocky Hart. He's the manager. We spent an hour together going over how the store is set up and the way the chain operates. Were you surprised that Cummings hired you since you don't have experience in retail involving guns and camping equipment? What Davis told me was that most of the customers are incredibly well-to-do men who enjoy female attention. 
He said he could hire someone else who was an expert with rifles and the other stuff. The store carries a large line of clothing and footwear, and I know that part of the business inside and out. Davis didn't think I'd have trouble transitioning. Alice heard a knock and sat silently. The receptionist put a cup of coffee on a napkin in front of her, along with a spoon and a packet of sweetener. Thanks, Alice said. So when did you start work? Alice took a taste of her coffee and looked at Miss Lipscomb attentively. My first day was May 1st. I spent a month at the New York store working with Rocky. Then I reported to Houston. I oversaw the build out and hired the employees. Okay, so tell me exactly what happened. Please start from the beginning. I talked to Davis on the phone about twice a week. The business calls were routine. I didn't think anything about them. The first time he came to Houston, he insisted on taking me to dinner. I tried to get out of it, but he absolutely insisted. We went to Mark's. The restaurant is a renovated church. I later found out that it had been voted Houston's most romantic restaurant. It's got gold ceilings and hand-painted deco walls, that kind of stuff. Anyway, he had reserved a private room where we had special tastings paired with wine. Davis got drunk and started putting his hand on my leg. I tried to discourage him by moving my chair away, but he didn't take the hint. Before we left, he asked me if I would like to go with him to get an after-dinner drink at some bar he knew downtown. I politely told him I had a headache. Did you ask him to take his hand off your leg? Alice typed furiously. No, I was so shocked. I didn't know what to do. I had moved to Houston by myself and have no friends or family here. The job paid a bit more than I was making in New York. I guess I should have made a big deal about it, but I took it that he'd had too much drink and didn't mean to touch me. He's married, you know, so I wasn't thinking that he was making a pass. So how did you get home? He dropped me off at the store and I took my own car from there. I remember he wasn't too happy. He didn't speak to me for a whole week. He didn't even pick up his cell when I called to file my reports. You made oral reports? Yes, I called twice a week to update him on the progress of the store build out. He told me he didn't like email. So what happened next? Alice looked at Miss Lipscomb. She could tell the woman was becoming anxious. I know this is hard, but you have to tell me exactly what happened. Davis just showed up. It was July 18th. He arrived at the store after the employees had left. I was by myself finishing an inventory report. He has a key to the building. I looked up and he was standing in the door of my office. It looked to me like he'd been drinking. He told me he was not happy with the way I'd handled the build out. Davis complained that I had let costs skyrocket and had not kept an eye on the contractors. I was shocked. All along, he'd been telling me everything was fine. By this time, Lipskin was beginning to tear up. Caulfield handed her a tissue. Please excuse me. I have a hard time talking about this. I understand. Would you like to take a break? No, let's get it over with. Alice sat quietly and took another sip of her now cold coffee. Miss Lipskin continued. Davis demanded I come out onto the floor so he could show me how I'd ruined the big game exhibit. Big game exhibit? Yeah, the build out. The store has an area in the center that's a living model of an African plains. It has a stuffed lion, zebra, and some other kinds of animals. It has a tree, rocks, that kind of stuff. It looks real. Anyway, we walked to the exhibit. He told me I had used too much space and that I was way over budget. As he was talking, he put his hand on my back. I was terrified. I tried to apologize, saying I didn't realize the exhibit was supposed to be smaller. I told him Rocky hadn't explained that to me. Then he jerked me toward him and, and, ground his mouth to mine, I jerked back. Tears slid down Liscombe's cheeks. She wiped them away and continued. Then he said, you whore, if you want to keep this job, you'll do as I say. He grabbed my wrist and held it tightly. I felt trapped. Alice took a deep breath and continued to rapidly type as she fought back a queasiness in her stomach. The woman was obviously traumatized. I so want to believe her, but I can't allow myself to be bamboozled. She looked at Lipscomb and said, did you protest? No, Davis is a big man. I was afraid he would hit me. By this time, Lipscomb was sobbing, twisting the tissue in her hands. Caulfield patted her shoulder. It's okay. What happened is not your fault, he said. She took a deep breath. Then he, then he, Lipscomb began to bawl uncontrollably. 
She rose and ran out of the room. Alice and Caulfield sat in silence. A few minutes later, the receptionist stuck her head into the conference room. Miss Lipscomb left. Alice turned to Caulfield. What happened? I don't know. Each time we start to talk about it, she gets upset and clams up. I was hoping she'd talk to you. Alice worked to control her mounting sense of foreboding. Whatever had happened must have been horrible, but proving the case was going to be a bitch. Maybe the delay was for the best. So why did she wait so long to file a complaint? She told me she was so ashamed and embarrassed that she tried to put it out of her mind. Because she's having a hard time finding a job and believes Cummings is behind it, she finally got angry enough to come forward. Okay, but at some point, she's going to have to tell me the rest of the story, and I need to hear it from her in person. This case, Alice knew, hinge on witness credibility. Sorry about this. I'll talk to her. Alice and Caulfield exchange business cards. I'll be in touch. Hi, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Inside the Minds of Authors. Today, we have an amazing Miss Marie W. Watts with us today, who just gave us this really fabulous reading. I'm all excited to get into this book to find out what is it about? Where did this idea come from? So, Miss Marie, welcome. I'm so excited to hear. How are you today? I am doing fabulous. It is a good day. Amazing. Let's jump right in. Tell us, what is the background of this story? Where did it come from? They always say you should write what you know. This is a subject that I know intimately. But I spent about 30 years of my professional career actually investigating employment discrimination. I started off working for the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission for 10 years. Then I went out on my own. I would do investigations for attorneys who would call me or companies. Usually an attorney would call me in to go into one of their clients. And I also did a large number of investigations in the federal sector. So I was a federal contractor. So I would go into the federal agencies and investigate their employment discrimination. You have a very interesting background with a lot of information to pull from. Like you've got plenty of stories to write more than a trilogy. Yes. <laughs> At one point at the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission, I was a supervisor. So I would literally see hundreds of cases. I would have to review what my investigators had done and sign off on them. So I've literally seen thousands of employment discrimination cases. And that gave me a rich thing to pull from. So to make sure all of our listeners are in tune with what we're talking about, can you give us a little bit of background of what the Equal Employment Commission is? Just tell us a little bit about it. Sure. When the Civil Rights Act of 1965 passed, they included in the Civil Rights Act the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission. Its job was to be sure that employment discrimination did not occur in the public sector businesses. What that says, it outlaws discrimination based on race, religion, sex, national origin, age, disability, and now we have genetic background as well. The agency is very small today, except for age discrimination. If the company has 15 or more employees and age is 20, they cannot discriminate on those factors against an employee. That is great information for anybody who's not aware that we do have these policies in place for anybody who's in the U.S. This is something very U.S.-centric. Other countries probably have something similar to us. So it's just to kind of give everybody a little frame of mind. We're talking U.S. right now and kind of what the federal sector has in place to protect people. The fact that you were able to take this and turn them into a story is amazing. So what genre are you writing in? What is this specifically? That is a good question. (laughs) I'm a genre mixed up person. I would say, in a way, it's a big mystery because I have not just this one case going on. We got a little taste of it at the beginning. We're working on a number of cases at the same time. Someone makes an allegation of discrimination. Well, it's not always discrimination, and it has to be proven. And a lot of times you can't prove it. It's not discrimination. It's something else. It is a big mystery because we're following them doing one case after the other. They're doing it simultaneously because they have a large cast of characters. I have the office manager, Alice. We have an attorney called Inman, who is African-American. We have African-American clerk who has sociophobia. 
we have two Hispanic investigators and an Asian investigator. So they are all doing their thing. And I also delve into their personal lives as well. Because as you know, when you work, your personal life is intertwined with your work life. You can't get away from that. We always bring our history, our backgrounds, our assumptions, and pretty much our perception into the job. So sometimes as much as we want to take away some of those bias, it comes wrap into that package. So I like the fact your office is very mixed, which is what expected from an equal opportunity office makes sense. When you decided to put this trilogy together and you started with this book, what made you pick this place? Because you picked literally the Obama administration to pick. Why that time frame? It took me a while to write it. So I guess I was writing it in a contemporary setting because I find that maybe a little bit easier for me to write more contemporary. If you go back too far, then you have to say, okay, well, there were no cell phones, were they? Or what was the office computers like at the time? It made it easier. And this is crazy. Even though I've been gone from the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission for a long time, I still have friends. And I even went this year to a reunion of retired people. And I was in the Houston office and I thought, okay, well, I don't want to put this in an office where I've worked because then everybody will just go berserk trying to figure out who's who, (laughs) who are you talking about, writing about, who are you saying this about? So I decided to put it in Austin and that's the reason for the secret investigation unit. And that's also a way to draw a cast of characters, people who had let's say, motive to want to get away from their regular office. Inman, for instance, he's stale. He's been in the same office forever, and he takes this assignment much to his wife's chagrin, and then he finds out more about his past than he ever wishes he had when he starts making old connections. It gives me a chance to give the characters some personal reasons for what they're doing. When you decided to put this book together, did you have a specific audience in mind? That's a good question. I think I mainly wrote it because that's how I saw the story. For instance, one of my problems with the mystery is, unbeknownst to me, if you're truly a mystery, you have to have a dead body. That's what they say. That's what the agents say. And I'm just like, I did this a long time. I saw a lot of things, but I never saw a dead body. For more traditionists, I can see a mystery and a dead body coming into play. But you can have a suspense. It doesn't have to have the mystery part of a thriller. And the thrillers doesn't come with a dead body all the time. So your books can fall into different categories. That doesn't have to be just the mystery. And I think also as far as being a women's fiction as well, because the characters do grow and change and they confront some of their personal issues. I'm about 50,000 words into the third book of the trilogy. Some of my, especially the female characters, will have grown and changed and developed and overcome their obstacles. So anybody who enjoys a good mystery, a good thriller, will enjoy your book? Yes. And the thing I'd like to say, I have a number of cases in there. The one read to you was pretty much out of my imagination, but the rest of the cases are based on real cases that I either saw worked on or read about. There is a lot of realism in the book. There's a lot of things that people can take from this book, especially if you're looking at real cases. What is one message you want people to get from it? I am a big proponent of diversity. I taught diversity. EEO, protecting discrimination is one thing, but if we all learn to be multicultural and diverse ourselves, then we won't have these problems. We won't need the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission because we will see each other as individuals with our strengths and our weaknesses. And that's one of the things I have tried hard to portray in the novel is these characters don't always get along. It's not like they come into the office and they're all kumbaya and they love each other. Okay, they don't. And they bring their own biases and prejudices, just like anybody else, into the office setting. And they have to learn to get along and respect each other. That is very real. It happens every day. You yes. don't have to like each other. You do have to respect each other. Yes. To be able to function together. Uh-huh. And also, one of the things I've done is I've tried to highlight people with disabilities. I have at least two characters. One is the clerk who has sociophobia. 
and the other Alice who we read about basically has an injury that she had was in a car wreck as a teen and walks with Kane and then she gets debilitated later on in the series. People with disabilities are a big thing for me. I wanted to ask you why you decided to make the character have a social phobia. I was like, you're in an office dealing with people. How does that work? <laughs> <laughs> well, that's the beauty of it. See, that's my secret. You'll have to read to find out how she makes it work. But this is the point. We see someone and we say if they have a disability. They can't do this job. But with reasonable accommodations and workarounds, things happen. We don't need to give up on somebody. We may look at them and say, you can't do this. That's not always true. I love the twist. I really thought I was like, that is so unique because you have so much depth in this one character. She has her dealing with her issues. And then I'm like, and then you're dealing in a social place that deals with the public. <laughs> very, very cute. I love the fact that you're pulling from your background and experience. But what gave you that push to actually write these books? I have a message of diversity that I want out. And yeah, I could stand up like I did for many years and teach it. Okay. But no, this is more fun. This is a fun way to get my message out so that people can see these characters confronting their own biases and how they work through them. It's always a lot more exciting to teach through stories than it is just to give you a PowerPoint presentation. People remember more. They, they have that emotional connection. Absolutely. That's the reason I did choose this. Have you been writing before you started this trilogy? Oh, yes. Gee, my first writing was when I was a little girl. I have a little book that I made called The Space Mouse, where I wrote it out in a pencil. Actually, I have a textbook that I co-authored, Human Relations, that's been out on the market since 1990. We're in our fourth edition, and the little booger's still selling, which is kind of exciting. And I call it a How to Behave at Work book. It talks about how to be successful in an office setting. And it's a um, college-level text. I have another nonfiction that I wrote that's a pictorial history of LaGrange, Texas. I have one other novel that's been published. I've got two that are sitting in a drawer. Maybe to be resurrected, maybe not. And then this trilogy. You have been one busy lady. You have an entire career that is highly demanding because you guys travel a lot and yeah. you still were writing. I'm so fascinated. How did you manage your time? Well, fortunately now I have retired from the business aspect so that I could turn my attention more full time to writing. I'm just one of these persons, I got to get my hands in everything, you know, so I try to <laughs> limit my, <laughs> my volunteer work so that I can focus on getting this trilogy finished. I don't blame you. I'm completely in the same boat with you. So yes, we have shiny object syndrome, easily distracted. There's all these fun things to do. Yeah, 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 yeah. What advice would you give an up and coming author who's decided I'm going to try to take my life story and turn it into a fiction novel? What would be the first thing you tell them? The first thing is you read, 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 read. I think the good thing about that is you can see how other authors develop stories, their plots, things like that. The other thing is to take courses. I think writing courses have been invaluable. I have taken quite a few in my time. And I think you need to do both of those things in order to get a good start. And not only take courses, but read books on the craft of writing. What books would you recommend to somebody? Now, that's a good question because I haven't looked at them in a while. So you got me there. <laughs> yes. Mission accomplished. I stumped the go. author. You stumped me. You stumped me. <laughs> well, the next question would be, what is your favorite book in general? It doesn't have to be on the craft. Wow. That is a hard, hard question. I have so many books that I've loved. One of the ones that keeps coming back to me is Les Miserables. I'll tell you a secret. I'm kind of a cheap person. So I read a lot of the classics <laughs> because I can get them free from the library. <laughs> I think everybody needs a library membership. I'm a true believer. It is a yes. great asset and you get such a diversity. So library, it is being resourceful, not cheap. So I'm all about this. Yes, yes. That's one of my favorites. It just seem to have so many personal 
struggles that the characters went through. So I enjoy that. Did you learn anything about yourself and your writing career when you were writing this trilogy? That's an interesting question. Did I learn anything about myself? Then I have a wonderful ability to procrastinate. I have found, and this is terrible, I can handle my writer's block by going to work computerized jigsaw puzzles, which is not a good. <laughs> Sounds like it was just be a time suck. Like you should get lost in time in that. Yes, it is a time <laughs> suck. <laughs> I'm not sure if you're working writer's block the same way the rest of us think about it. <laughs> <laughs> One of the things I did do this year, and it's been great for me, the Women's Fiction Writers Association. I joined earlier this year. And we have a virtual writing group that meets every day for two hours. And it's varied times during the day. And we get people from across the country. And we sign in on Zoom, say good morning, work 45 minutes, come back if you want and say your progress. And then we go back in and work another 45 minutes. It gives me a writer's community. And it's also helped me structure, okay, you know, Nine o'clock, time to write. As you know, one of the biggest things is if you're sitting at home and you go, oh, well, maybe I need to go wash a load of clothes instead of write. So that has helped me and that's helped me keep on track. So it has given you a schedule and also has given you an accountability partner. Absolutely. I have to come back on and I don't want to be embarrassed and say, well, I didn't do anything during the 45 minutes. <laughs> Look to the computer. I got distracted. Yes, it is an accountability partner. And that is actually a really incredible resource for people. Yes. Because sometimes you should need somebody else to know. You might not share with the world, but if somebody knows you're supposed to be writing and they ask you, how did you do? You might want to not be embarrassed and be like, I wrote. And the nice thing is we don't expand on what we're writing. Most of us just say, well, I'm on chapter 32 and I'm having a little trouble here and then just go on. It's a quick check-in. And you don't get lost of how much you have to divulge to people if you're not comfortable. So that's kind of cool. Yeah. Yeah. Sweet. When you decided to, okay, I'm going to do this. I'm going to publish this book. What was the hardest thing for you to overcome? I think the hardest thing to overcome was the fact that because I didn't necessarily fit into a niche that I would go to say writer's conference and I would talk to an agent. I had a number of them interested, but we never could quite make the next hump. And then the last time I went, I saw a bunch of young agents and not to say anything negative about youngsters, but they had no idea what the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission was. They had no idea. And having been someone that suffered through discrimination in my career, I'm like, okay, I need to get this story out. So I decided to just do it myself. I have a couple books out. What does your readership say about the book? I have a few people, of course, that don't like it, but then have the New England Critic Review just loved it. And I had another one that we sent out for review. So they're not like my friends, people I don't know, which is good. Those are um, important. Yeah really enjoyed it. So, I mean, I have some good reviews and got the occasional three or something where they just couldn't get into it. I'm getting some very positive feedback. And I had a a gentleman who actually read the book and he said it was out of his comfort zone, but he had daughters and he was just kind of blown away. It is such an appropriate theme and topic going on right now. And a lot of the times, unless you're in that group that is suffering, you might not understand their pains and suffering. You're not understanding where they're coming from. So I do appreciate that he read it and saw it from the perspective of his daughters. It's going to make him much more caring of their struggles and what they're going through. Absolutely. That is a very impactful moment when you realize, okay, this book might not apply to me, but I have families in this situation. Yes. And I think really the good thing about the book is because it's not just persons of, You know, I think sometimes people don't realize that persons of color have their own biases and prejudices. Okay, they think it's just white people that do it all. And when I taught, one of the things I taught is it's an issue of power. If you're in a position of power, you have the ability to discriminate. 
if you take a look, say at Houston, Texas, which is one of the most diverse cities in the country these days, the whole area, you have an interesting dynamic because there is no majority race in Houston anymore. And I have been into investigative situations, especially in Houston, where those that get into power, and I'll just tell you one of my fascinating cases I had one time, this is way back when I was at the EEOC, is we had a restaurant that the Hispanic, hired Hispanic kitchen manager, then I had some African-American women come in. He was cutting their hours. I didn't even have to investigate. All I did was look at the payroll and you could start seeing the names change on the payroll to Hispanic surnames. And the kitchen hours were larger than they had been before he started. So obviously he was cutting the hours of the other non-Hispanics until they quit and then hiring Hispanics. Okay, he had the power, he was in the position, and he used his biases and prejudices to change the dynamics. It is a human condition, not so much a race condition. And as long as people understand it, we come with these biases. Mm -hmm. And you have to make a conscious decision to change them because they don't automatically go away. Absolutely. So it's incumbent on all of us. And I think that's one of the things I try to show in the book is that we all walk in with biases and prejudices. We can't help it. That's part of our, as you said, our human condition. So it's what we do with them. I think that's the beautiful thing. People need to realize understanding that you have these things and you can change them. And as long as you're aware, yeah, as long as you're aware of them, you can Mm -hmm. do something about it. Mm -hmm. So tell us, madam, what are you currently working on? Okay, so I'm working on the end of the trilogy. How is it coming? It's coming really good because of my writing group. So I'm probably about a little over halfway through with the rough draft. So I'm just churning away. We've got lots of surprises at the end, so it'll be good. But I did want to mention that I am available to speak to book clubs, and I do have some book clubs that are interested in diversity and all of that. And also on my website, I do have questions for book clubs, and there's questions in the back of the book for those that want to have book club discussions and diversity, and I'm available to do those remotely. What is your website now that we're talking about it? Tell us, where can we yeah. find you? Marie Watts, M-A-R-I-E-W-A-T-T-S dot com. Simple, we can find you. Yeah. Not any problem. Great. Yeah. Madam, we're switching gears. Are you ready for what's coming? I think. Let's do it. Let's do it. We're jumping into our lightning round. Fun, easy. Let's see what you come up with. Ready? Uh Uh-huh. First one. Apple cider or pumpkin spice? Uh, apple cider. You have to think about that one. You're like, Yes. (laughs) Ebook or paperback? Ebook. Pancakes or waffles? Um, pancakes. Okay, okay. What is your favorite place to write? I have an office. And I write in my office. It's my she shed. Okay. It's set off from the house. So I don't have to mess with my husband and all his TV. And I have a window that I can look out over my tanks. I have like ponds. And I have my little bird feeder set up outside so I can be distracted by the birds too. So that's where I write. Absolutely lovely. That is awesome. Nice. Here's your last one. Let's see what you have. If you had a warning label, what would it be? Ooh, don't mess with Watts. I like it. Awesome. (laughs) Madam, it has been such a pleasure to have you. Such an amazing information you're putting together in a fictional work for everybody to enjoy. Do you have any closing remarks for us? Just it's a tough time out there. Just keep the faith. Keep your head up. It will pass. I keep telling myself that, so maybe it's a good thing for me to tell y'all, so I keep thinking it, and we'll make it through this okay. Madam, thank you again for joining us. It has been exciting. And to our listeners, go ahead, give this podcast a like, share it with somebody, give us a review, let other people know, let's continue to grow this community, and thank you for joining us. And once again, we'll see you next week with another amazing author, and have an amazing day. Bye, everyone.